ahead and do that. And um, let me go ahead and hand it over to Jeff and John. John, you want to kick us off or should sure. I just jump right in? Sure. Hello, everyone. John Nesbitt with the Contrast Federal Team. We thank you all for attending tonight. Uh, today, we have with us our co-founder of Contrast Security, Jeff Williams, and our CTO. And with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Jeff. Again, thanks for your time. Thanks, John. And uh, thanks, other John and Laura, for uh, hosting this. I appreciate it. Um, look, we got a small group here, so I'd love to make this conversational to the extent possible. Um, we're talking about zero days, uh, you know, similar to the log4j incident that some of you may have wrestled with recently. Uh, what do you do to prevent the next library vulnerability that gets discovered? It could happen today, it could be tomorrow, it could be in a few months, but somebody's going to turn up another terrible zero day in a library, and it's going to affect a lot of people. So how do we stop that from happening? Um, I'll take a minute and introduce myself. Uh, uh, so I've been in application security for a little over 20 years. Um, I helped to start one of the world's first application security teams during the dot-com boom. Uh, we had an opportunity to look at lots of the applications that were being spun up during that time and search for security vulnerabilities. Uh, I helped start OWASP. So I was one of the early members there. Uh, I wrote the OWASP top 10 and WebGoat, and I led a bunch of other open source projects there that got pretty popular. Um, and then they asked me to, to take over as the global chair of OWASP, which I didn't want to do, but uh, I did anyway. And I led it for 10 years and grew OWASP to pretty big. Uh, we've got 250 chapters around the world, uh, lots of uh, conferences uh, also around the world, and a huge number of open source projects. So if you're interested, in application security. And I, I do think it's a great field to be in. Uh, check out OS. There's lots of great resources there for folks to learn from. Um, let's see. Well, let's just jump right in and, and start talking about uh, libraries. So uh, the first thing that I wanna, I wanna do is just summarize the whole, uh, the whole debate here. You can't prevent the next zero day from, it's gonna happen. There, the vulnerability is already out there. It's in the field, it's in apps and there's nothing that we can do about it. There are something like 37 million different open source library versions out there. Uh, any one of them could have a horrific vulnerability and almost any one of them could be in any of the, the libraries that are out there. So it's really, it's, it's difficult to understand the scope of this problem. Almost every application these days is built with open source. Uh, usually uh, applications, like a modern web application probably has a hundred or more open source libraries in it. Not all of them are directly referenced by the application. Some of them are what are called transitive dependencies. So you get a whole tree of libraries coming in. Um, and the vulnerability could be custom to those libraries, or it could be something that's, uh, you know, something, a, a generic class of vulnerabilities that we kind of know about, but we're in a situation where we can't prevent this from coming. So this talk is really about how to prepare for the next zero day, because <laughs> we can be ready for it and we can do things to make the impact significantly less. So let's start out here. So first of all, it's important to understand that most library, most vulnerabilities are latent. They're undiscovered vulnerabilities out there. I think, you know, there's like a couple hundred new CVEs discovered every week, but there are probably, and nobody knows how to measure this, but there are probably a lot, lot, lot more that we haven't discovered. And we know this, because anytime somebody discovers a vulnerability, like the one in log4j, we see a timeline that looks kind of like this. You can see up here, uh, the first uh, discoveries of log4j happened in like the end of November last year. And then uh, it starts getting exploited, it's patched. And then by December 10th, researchers have dug in and found a different vulnerability in that library. 
And so that then we release you know version 2.16 and people start now they've they've updated to 2.15. So now they got updated to 2.16. And then within the next few days, several others, there's one on the 14th and one on the 17th. Uh, I'm sorry, actually that's the same one. It, it, it they discovered it and then they discovered a way to use it to get full control over an application. And so eventually 2.17 gets released. Uh, and sure enough, the next day, another vulnerability gets discovered. And uh, this one's pretty critical. So now we're at 2.17.1 uh, is the latest uh, release. And this is pretty typical. It means that when we look hard at open source, we find vulnerabilities kind of wherever we look. All of the CVEs that are out there that get discovered are discovered by volunteer researchers, just do-gooders that like helping out. And they do this research in their spare time. Sometimes they get a bug bounty, but not usually on open source libraries because there's no the open source project doesn't have any money to pay them. They're volunteers too. So this Log4j library, which is used in almost every job application on the planet. And by the way, about half of interesting web applications out there use Java. Uh, that project, Log4j, was maintained by three people and on also volunteers. And so, you know, we're in a situation where not a lot of people are being motivated to look at the security of open source libraries. So it is something we've got to really think about. Did anyone here have to deal with the Log4j situation at their company? I think everyone had to deal with the log4j situation at your company, I feel like. Yeah, how did it go? Was it a smooth process? So for us, it was uh, more about making sure that uh, the customers were kept abreast of uh, the updates that were coming out to address the, uh, yeah. but it's it's a not a fun process. No, it, it certainly wasn't for a lot of companies. Um, so we'll dig into like a little bit more about this, but uh, if you know that there's a lot of latent vulnerabilities out there, the key is being able to respond quickly. So we need to think about what processes do we need in place in order to respond to a new zero day that just gets discovered. And it's easy to run a, you know exercises around this. You can just imagine, uh, let's say a vulnerability was discovered in struts tomorrow or uh, you know, Microsoft Core Lab, and there's a new vulnerability processes that every company needs to have in place. The first is you need to have a process in place to write secure code. Uh, this is the custom code that only you write. Nobody else has access to this, but you, you're writing this. And it doesn't matter. It could be applications, APIs, microservices, internal applications. I don't even know if, if calling apps internal and external makes sense that much anymore, given the, the, the perimeter doesn't really work anymore. But anyway, that, that's all of your code. The next one is you got to lock down the software supply chain. And we'll dig into this a little bit, but uh, this is third-party code that you're using in your applications. And then the last piece is uh, how do you secure operations so that you know if you're being attacked and how do you have the ability to respond to attacks? So these, these three areas are uh, kind of what I think about falls into the AppSec bucket. Mostly when people think about Log4j, they think about this locking down the supply chain. Like, Where's the open source being used? What do we do? But I'm going to try to convince you that these other two areas are equally important if you want to be really prepared for uh, the next zero day. We'll talk about that. And Evelyn suggests the first thing you need to know is what is in your code. And we're going to talk about that. Uh, that is a fantastic segue. So I would say, so the, the first thing is we want to talk about securing the supply chain. And I wanted to, to get you to think about what's in your software supply chain a little bit. So in, in some ways, thinking about the code that you write is part of your supply chain. Instead of getting it from some third party, 
you're getting it from an internal development group. But from an organizational perspective, it's really just part of the supply chain uh, that, that ends up creating your software. So that's, that's one piece. Then there's code that you run, like products that you buy, internal systems. That's, I think, also part of the supply chain. What you import is where we're focused today. This is open source libraries that you're, you're taking from God knows where and bringing them into your application. And the last piece is one that people don't think about too much. This is all the code that you build with. And uh, the tools that you use in your development environment are part of your supply chain. They're critically important. And if an attacker is able to compromise some part of your build tools, your compilers, your IDEs, your test systems, they can Trojan your code and all the downstream consumers of your code will be compromised. So this is an area that's getting very little attention so far. I mean, think about your average developer's laptop and what software is running on there. And in most organizations, it's completely out of control. So this is an area that I think uh, you know, needs further scrutiny for sure. Um, it's a good question from Peter here on why use log4j instead of just using like system.out and system.air. Maybe there'd be, maybe that's a, a, a rhetorical question, but I'll throw it out to the group. Like, why would you use a library for logging instead of just, you know, built-in stuff? So as I understand it, typically the log4j gives you a lot more control over uh, where the logs are going. And there are a lot more built-in things for at like an enterprise level uh, to where you can emit logs to, uh, you know, a, uh, a log server somewhere uh, or for, you know, it's got to go up the chain so you can handle things at an enterprise level. Yeah. yeah. Turns out, uh, oh yeah, go ahead. Well, yeah, from what I understand, um, one of the, one of the issues with logs that some companies are starting to tackle is people have a requirement to actually save logs, but they don't know actually how to read them. And log4j actually does behavior analysis uh, as part of its script or it's part, it, it, it in part does some of that, just like um, whoever was speaking with me did it beforehand. So sorry, my daughter's in the bathtub. But the point, the point of the matter is it gives you a little bit more functionality than a simple system out system error. Yeah. Yeah, enterprise logging is actually really complicated. Um, you know, imagine if you were running hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of applications. And if you're a financial institution, like Evelyn suggested, you probably have a requirement to keep those logs for seven years. There's also you know, quite a lot of mm, sort of configuration. You probably wanna set logging policies across whole divisions of an organization and you know, collect different logs at different times. Uh, the, the problem that we got into with Log4j at the core of it was actually a pretty simple enterprise requirement. They wanted to be able to parameterize some of the things that go into logs rather than like hard coding them into every application. They wanted to have a central location to look up like what's the host name or what's our division name or something like that. And those lookups are what ended up enabling attackers to, to bring in malicious code into the application and, and run it. But I just wanted you to see like, like libraries do powerful things and developers are, are using these powerful capabilities and they, they naturally will introduce vulnerabilities if you're not careful with them. So uh, not sure I understood the question from Peter. Can you clarify what you were talking about there with uh, using bad log for j Well, think about it. Who's using the systems? Who's using the systems? Using log for j Who's using me? It? Everybody. Containerization? Or what, let's say you're using web server, JA servers. Who's using it? Who cares about it? Because you couldn't, it's not, it's not working that way. If you use containerization using log or JS. I'm sorry, I'm kind of missing it. Every like even containers don't matter that much to this problem because 
this is these are application layer logs that are getting generated and sent to a sim somewhere. Um, but the users of the applications are people like you and me. Uh, you, you probably use Log4j every single day. Okay. Therefore, if you use the systems, therefore, enter the systems to stop inside of the systems stops using log JA systems. It stops the enter systems. It stops it outside the enter, enter systems, the net. Okay. It stops. All right, well, we, well, we can follow up on that in a, in a minute. Uh, let's go back to securing the software supply chain. So let's think about how you might do that. So. Uh, I think there's really two big pieces here and Evelyn suggested the first one, which is you gotta have an inventory of what open source you're using. And it's not easy because it changes fast. Like even on a single project, you might have a, a dozen different branches, each of which might have different open source included uh, depending on what they're working on. Uh, you know, that comes together in build systems and CICD pipelines, eventually probably running them on test servers, then eventually some of those make it into production. And really, if you want to handle open source, you got to know where all your open source is running. So we've got to have some automation that will collect data about what open source is running where. Anybody doing anything like this in, in their organization? No, I think a lot well, of people- I don't know about automatic inventory, but um, um, I'm, I'm part of the US military. And so, yeah, we're having to, we're having to account for all of our software uh, with, you know, SBOMs and everything. Yeah, I was gonna bring up SBOMs. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, we'll look at that in, in just a second. But uh, it is a really tricky problem. Like if all you look at is the source code repo, and you say, okay, well, I'm gonna run some tool that generates an SBOM from the source code repo. And I should pause here. SBOM stands for Software Bill of Materials. And really it's just a list of the libraries and versions that are in something. So uh, it's, it's all the rage these days because uh, in President Biden's executive order on cybersecurity, he, uh, he makes a big deal about SBOMs. He said, you know, all government systems, we're gonna generate SBOMs for them and we're gonna maintain those and make them available. And NIST implemented that, uh, that guidance and it's going out. And so there's, there's a lot of interest in SBOMs happening these days, but not all SBOMs are created equal. As we'll see here in a minute, if you scan an open source, like, a, I'm sorry, if you scan a source code repo, you'll get sort of one view of what software is there, but it's probably not super accurate. It'll have some libraries that aren't, uh, so it'll have some libraries that aren't actually in the, the running application, things like test libraries and uh, you know other kinds of, of de development code. And it'll also miss some things. It'll miss libraries that come from the, the runtime environment, like libraries that are in your application server, like XML parsers and uh, other libraries that, that come from the environment won't show up in the SBOM. So we'll talk in a minute, but I, I think uh, you know having a tool that measures what code is actually in running applications is the right way to do this. So it's somehow, whether you use SBOMs or not, uh, you need to figure out a way to automate your application inventory. I think SBOMs are actually more useful in an external facing way. Like if somebody asks you what's in this application, uh, internally, I think SBOMs are gonna create a lot of friction because instead of like having an automated system that just collects data and reports it to a database, you're gonna have uh, thousands of SBOMs being generated all the time. Like do you generate one for every branch, every test server? Every, what, where do you do with all these documents? And do you parse them into a database and store them somewhere? So I think it's gonna get real complicated, uh, but I, I think the right answer here is one way or another, 
you need to have an up-to-date database that you can ask. If you typed in log4j, it would show you exactly what applications have log4j in it, exactly what servers they're running on, and then you can go respond in an emergency. So that's the first thing. You can't really respond if you don't know where this is. And there are companies that are still scanning for log4j. They're out there investigating, digging into applications, trying to figure out if log4j is in there. And it's not as straightforward as you think. Uh, sometimes log4j gets kind of blended in with other code. It's called shading. And so it, it takes a bunch of jars and smushes them all into one big jar. And Java doesn't care, but any tools that are designed to find log4j are gonna struggle in that environment. Uh, so there's a number of, of kind of practical challenges there. The second thing that you should try to do in your organization is keep your libraries close to the latest version. Sometimes it's tempting to just say, well, this application's not broken, uh, so we'll just leave it. And you know, years go by and you're using a, a version of, of log4j that's like eight years old, and then a new vulnerability comes out. And now you're really stuck because now you've got a huge gap between the old version and the new version. Nobody goes back and patches the old version, by the way. You have to move to the latest version of the open source library. And so that can be a huge jump. It can require rewriting your application. The APIs might've changed. Uh, so it can be really difficult. So when you use open source, you know people say it's free and open, but it's not really free. When you use open source, you're taking on an obligation to keep it up to date. And it's not terrifically hard if you, if you stay on top of it, but it is like, you know, you, you get this advantage of not having to write all that code. Uh, it rockets your development speed forward, but you have this ongoing duty now to keep up with what's going on in that code. Anybody uh, out there wrestle with this kind of problem? Like, do you keep your libraries up to date or do you just kind of wait until there's a CVE and then go back and try and patch it? The wishful answer or the real answer? <laughs> <laughs> I love the real answer. The real answer is set it up and say using Java. Let's say you're using Java, looking inside of the systems. Open source, think about it. Think about IBM. Here is a, another job. Here is another job. Here is something else. Look at this. Look at this URI. Look at what they're saying about this using inside of JA servers, WebSphere systems. They change it this way. And think about who's using it inside of the JVM systems. They use it this way to change it this way. Uh huh. Okay. Um, so I wanted to talk about a tool that I wrote called JBOM that's totally free and open that you can use to generate SBOMs for anything running on Java. And JBOM is a runtime bill of materials tool. Instead of trying to scan a code repo, like most of the tools out there, JBOM attaches to a JVM and from inside, it identifies what libraries are there and extracts the, the bill of materials information. And what you get back is a really accurate bomb. And I can show it to you here. Uh, it's really simple to run. Um, you can just download it from the, I'll, I'll put the, the website up there, but it's in GitHub. It's uh, uh, in the contrast security open source uh, repo, but you just download a jar file, right? So I've got uh, the, oh, so I've got the, the JBOM uh, file here. This is, uh, you know, you can just grab that off of, off of GitHub. And then to run it, you can just do java-jar uh, with the JBOM. And here, I'll take off this, this last bit. That's, uh, we'll talk about that in a second. This just runs and very quickly, it found a, a process, a Java process, attached to it, extracted the SBOM information, and then wrote it out to this file. And if I pull this up, Here's the SBOM that it just generated. Um, 
which is pretty cool. It's got, you know, all the libraries identified. You can see here's, uh, hey, guess what? Uh, Log4j. So, uh, you know, it's a powerful little tool that you can use. Um, you can also use it remotely. So if I want to do all the, the uh, Java processes running remotely on some host, um, and I could put in any host name here, but uh, you use your uh, SSH credentials, login. Oops, I might have messed that up. Um, use your SSH credentials and log in, and this will, uh, I blew it. And this will attach remotely to all, uh, a remote host. This one uh, doesn't have any job process on it, but uh, you get the idea. It's a very fast way of generating SPOMs. And you can imagine using this to automate the collection of library data across a whole bunch of hosts, like maybe your whole test environment or your whole production environment. You could just, I don't know, once a day, go grab all the SPOMs and bring them together in a database so that you know what libraries are where. Uh, there, thanks to Peter for posting this. There are a bunch of ways of solving the log4j problem. This is a, a little bit out of date one. The best way is to update to uh, log4j uh, 1.17.1 that we were talking about. Anyway, um, so that's, that's JBOM. I think it's a nice little tool uh, that uh, is pretty powerful. Hey, Jeff. Yeah. Does 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 this bill of materials tool um, address, I think one of the issues you described earlier, um, where you have uh, things that you're building and running and then there's those uh, ancillary things that might be in the environment. Um, does it uh, does it help solve that problem also? Um, pick, yeah. pick up everything on the machine or, or? Yeah, so this will pick up any libraries that are being used by the application. So including things from the application server, uh, including uh, any libraries that are part of that running application will get picked up. So it, it'll produce a, a different SBOM than what you get if you ran on the, you know, the, the source code repo for this application. Fantastic, cool, thank you. It also solves the problem of shaded libraries. Uh, it digs into, uh, you know, when the, the tools that do the shading actually leave behind some evidence of what had happened in the shading and JBOM, analyzes that and identifies the shaded libraries as well. Okay, uh, so that's the first thing. You gotta get an inventory. Seems pretty straightforward. I don't think any of this stuff is that complicated by the way. So I, I uh, added this to the OWASP top 10 in 2013. I added a requirement that said, you shouldn't use libraries that have known vulnerabilities which I thought was fairly uncontroversial, but it got a lot of pushback. And here we are now almost 10 years later. And uh, you know, now people are finally starting to wake up to this problem of insecure libraries, but uh, it's been a long time. I mean, this is kind of basic blocking and tackling kind of stuff. But anyway, so the first thing is got to know what your open source libraries are. Uh, second thing is you got to use those libraries safely. And here's, this is a really simplified uh, sort of dependency tree for a library, but you write some awesome code and maybe you only use three libraries directly, but there's a good chance that each of those libraries uses a whole bunch of other libraries. And those libraries may use other libraries. This can be a really deep tree, especially in like node.js. You could have a thousand libraries in a node.js application easily. And anywhere in that tree, there might be some feature in some sub 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 library that does some super dangerous thing. Like maybe it calls runtime.exec or maybe it writes a file to disk or maybe it uh, you know, does a SQL query or something. You may not know all the things that your library does. Unless you sit down and read the code, you're probably not gonna know. So it's important to think about how you use these libraries. And in the case of log4j, uh, the, the dangerous thing that it does is it writes log messages out to a file or to some system. And 
for a long time, there's been a, a rule in the security world that says, hey, you know, before you write data out to something, you should probably escape it so that it doesn't have control characters in it that might affect the system that you're writing it to. And so we would call this log injection. If you just take untrusted data and write it out to a log, uh, an attacker could inject that. Like a simple thing they could do is they could inject carriage returns and line feeds to, to ruin the format of the log file. Like you could even inject false log entries that way just by forging the right data. So uh, if you had a rule in your organization to not allow log injection, like you say, hey, look, we're gonna make data safe before we log it, then you wouldn't be vulnerable to log4j. You'd be completely safe. And so, you know, in, it depends on the vulnerability a little bit. In this case, you know, it, it would be a little, it's a little bit hard to, to escape every place you write to log files. But for some vulnerabilities, the easiest thing to do is just to use the library safely. Like for SQL injection, for instance, if you use parameterized queries, you're, you'll eliminate most SQL injections. And so like using the parameterized interface to a SQL library, as opposed to the, you know, the, where you, the a SQL interface where you pass in a big concatenated string, that's more dangerous. So we really want to encourage people to use libraries safely. And if you're adopting a new library in your organization, it's a good idea to have some kind of standard that says, hey, we investigated this library. Here's how we're going to use it at VMware or Goldman or wherever you work. Uh, think about it a little bit so that you use the library safely and you'll You'll, this will end up making it much easier for you to respond in the case of a new zero day that comes out. If you had a strong policy that said, hey, we, we're going to not have log injection in your whole organization, and someone discovers the, you know, the next log4j or something, you could easily say, look, well, no, we're probably not at risk because we don't write untrusted data to log files. So thanks. Uh, we'll probably update the library when we you know, get around to it, but we're not vulnerable right now. Does that make sense? Yeah, it, it makes takes, sense. Thanks, Jeff. It takes a little level of discipline to do this that I'm not sure every organization has. But I have worked with organizations that do this. When they adopt a new library, they think about how they're going to use it to make sure that it's safe. And then the last thing that I want to emphasize is use runtime protection. So I'm going to talk a little bit about runtime application self-protection. And there's, there's two steps here. One, you add RASP to your application server, and I'm gonna show you how to do that. And then the second step is, that's it. You walk away because now you've got runtime protection that prevents many classes of vulnerabilities from being exploited. So I don't know what the next zero day is gonna be. It might be expression language injection. It probably will be expression language injection. It might be something totally different. It might be a command injection flaw. It might be some native code loading thing. It might be SSRF. Uh, we don't know, but RASP eliminates whole classes of vulnerabilities. Uh, I'll make an analogy to try to explain what RASP does. If you remember about 10 years ago, maybe a little more, we, had, we were constantly getting kernel exploits in operating systems. And the reason was people weren't using memory safe calls very well. And so, uh, most of the major compiler vendors started added, adding techniques to their compilers, things like ASLR and DEP, that's uh, address space randomization and data execution prevention. Those techniques make exploiting buffer overflows really difficult. And so the, the prevalence of buffer overflows uh, and memory kinds of attacks went way down. And now they're very rare. The same thing is true of RASP, but for like web application vulnerabilities, like the OWASP top 10 kinds of vulnerabilities. RASP makes them really hard to exploit. So even if you have them in your application, you can safely continue to operate those applications in production. Um, so here's an example of an attack that you can stop with, uh, with this kind of RASP protection. This is unsafe deserialization. Many applications use deserialization to transfer data around, uh, but it's super dangerous if you're accepting uh, serialized objects from clients. So let's say you've got a little app, maybe it's a mobile app, 
and you use a serialized object to communicate from your mobile app up to the server. So when the, the server receives a serialized object, it deserializes it, means that it turns it into objects, and then it starts using that object in the application. Well, guess what? Um, if an attacker sends a malicious object, one that's designed with data that might look something like this, instead of having like normal data in it, it has dangerous data in it. When that malicious object uh, gets sent to the server and gets deserialized, as part of the deserialization process, this object will, uh, will cause some code to get run. And in certain cases, the attacker can control what code runs. So this will cause, I mean, like you can run a native process like this to run a, a calculator process. And there's no way to stop this on the network, by the way. Like all you would see on the network is just some gobbledygook that looks like this. WAFs can't stop this. Firewalls can't stop this. IDS can't stop this because they're not going to deserialize this. Uh, this nothing. And so, Peter, your question about uh, login authorization and SSL—they can't stop this because we're talking about an authorized user uploading a malicious object and taking over your server. Nothing about SSL will stop this. This goes through the SSL tunnel. So. Uh, this is pretty dangerous stuff if you're accepting untrusted serialized objects. So we can stop it. Uh, we can't stop it with a WAF because the WAF only sees the network traffic. It, that data will come in, it'll flow through the web application, and eventually the attack will just run. All the WAF might see is, I mean, in this case, this is a SQL injection attack. The attack won't be able to, to decode this. There's like a zillion ways of... of of uh, tricking WAFs to, to get bypasses. But RASP works differently. With RASP, we can weave sensors into the application itself. And when we see this data come in, we can track that untrusted data. We can see that that data falls into this query, right, you know, in between these quote characters. We can see that this data actually changes the meaning of the query, uh, modifies it to return all records. Uh, same with the unsafe deserialization. We can see that that untrusted data was used to, uh, you know, was fed into a deserialization engine and caused something bad to happen, like a, a native process to run. Uh, so RASP then, when it sees this bad behavior, can intervene. It can, in, in the SQL injection case, it can say, hey, I'm not going to send that query to the database because I know it's malicious. For the unsafe deserialization, it can say, I'm not going to start a native process as part of deserializing this object because that should never happen. So it must be an attack. And we can rule out whole massive classes of, uh, of attacks this way. So those are the three things. Got to get an inventory, got to use your library safely. And for God's sakes, put RASP on your web applications and web APIs. It's really, a, 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 if you do those three things, you'll be safe and you'll be able to respond to the next zero day really easily. I thought I'd take a minute and just talk about what Contrast does. Uh, we have a platform uh, for secure coding that helps organizations make sure that they've done these things. So in development, we've got a number of ways of continuously analyzing your application. We do it a little differently, like JBOM. Contrast analyzes applications from the inside. So it works a little bit like a new relic or an app dynamics for performance, except for, you know, it, we do it for security. And because we're inside the running application, we can be way more accurate and way faster than traditional application security tools like your scanners. Contrast just runs continuously in your applications, in your test environment. And any of you can use this. Uh, you just do your normal development process and Contrast is there in the background finding vulnerabilities while you just, you don't have to exploit anything. You don't have to be a hacker. You can just use your application normally and contrast will find uh, critical vulnerabilities like complex uh, injection flaws and things. So it's it uh, can be really fun to use. We also do library analysis. So we have a software composition analysis capability. Uh, it's built into our, our other tools. So we actually assess the code and the libraries at the same time, because really they're all one big app and you need to understand the 
code to understand the libraries and the libraries to understand the code. It's better to do just to do that all as one thing rather than running two separate scans on the same application. So that takes care of a, a lot of what we talked about today uh, to help you respond to zero days. And then we also have Contrast Protect, which is a RASP product. You add it to your applications and it prevents those applications from being exploited in production. Uh, so you can see we support a whole bunch of different languages, Java, .NET, .NET Core, Node, Ruby, Python, Go, JavaScript, PHP, Kotlin, Scala. Um, so for uh, Java, for instance, uh, our customers that were using Contrast Protect, they were perfectly safe during the log for shell uh, debacle. <laughs> and you can see some of our customers responded how happy they were. Uh, you know, one, this, this one at the bottom uh, here, you can see this is at a, uh, a major insurance company. Uh, they said, hey, the teams that were using contrast got to have the weekend off versus all the other teams that were running around scrambling to try to find and fix where log for J was. So their customer, uh, they were really happy because they could just walk to the contrast console and type in log for J and they get a list of exactly which applications were using Log4j and exactly what servers they were running on in dev and test and prod. So they, they can then go quickly remediate. That's cool, Jeff. That's really impactful. We were so excited. I mean, you know, I hate when new vulnerabilities come out, but for us, it was really kind of a great way to show off uh, our technology and, and how we do that. We also, of course, you know, we, we do support the right secure code side of things. So, you know, we we help you make sure that the code you're writing is secure and you're, you're using those libraries safely. So uh, with that, I think uh, we're, we're just about out of time. Uh, so I'll stop here. I, I welcome questions about just about anything. I've done just about everything there is to do in application security. I've done a lot of threat modeling, a lot of pen testing, code review, AppSec programs, uh, I've I've been on both sides of it as a developer and a security guy. So I think I'm pretty empathetic about uh, working with developers. I don't really blame development teams for making vulnerabilities or for getting attacked. I think it's actually good if you detect a vulnerability, that's a sign that you're doing things right. So, uh, you know, I, I do a lot of writing on LinkedIn. I encourage you to connect with me on LinkedIn uh, if you're interested in any of this kind of stuff. But yeah, uh, any questions from anybody? I don't know if you can hear my dogs, but uh, they're going crazy in the background. Think about Argo. To Laura, TV. what's your reaction? How do you, you know, how well prepared do you think organizations are for the next log for j I think it varies widely. <laughs> uh, maybe that's I mean, I, you know, I feel yeah. like what you talked about, like people have really good intents to do it, but the actual execution is often lacking. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. I don't think people are prepared. I think people, you know, they're concerned, but they're not prepared. And I, I know that people care because every time there's one of these things, everybody goes crazy. Everyone like can't believe that you could have a vulnerability Equifax. Like, how could you possibly have a vulnerability? And I know every company I've worked with has vulnerabilities as bad as Equifax. They're, they're all over the place, but there's all this outrage. And so there's some disconnect somewhere. Like people believe that applications are way more secure than they really are. And that's like a problem in the software market is that there's not transparency. And that's why I'm really excited about SBOMs is it's like a, a, a cracking the door open towards a little bit of transparency in the market. Who here banks online? Anybody, everybody? Everybody probably banks online. I, I do. find someone who doesn't, I would expect. <laughs> so here's, here's how you can ask yourself about transparency. What do you know about the software that you trust with your finances? or your healthcare or your national defense or your government or your elections or your social life or you know anything. Else. How much do you know about that software? Think about time cards. Time cards was a problem with Kronos for one month. Health companies, 
it was a problem for one month. Read it. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, visibility is awful. So, you know, I, I think we have this blind trust and uh, that we, if once people pull back the curtain, there's gonna be a lot of surprised people out there uh, about how insecure our software infrastructure really is. I think the one of the problems that organizations struggle with is the, uh, well, depends on how old old you are, how long you've been doing things, uh, that that kind of stuff. But it, it's the 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 where to start and 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 what to do. I mean, if you look at the landscape of security tooling, uh, whether it's uh, static code analysis on on the code that you're developing or uh, your artifact repository, and making sure that all the stuff that's actually going into what's yeah. being produced in your fleet of uh, uh, instances running in the cloud or whatever, uh, that that it's it's churning up the right the, the right things. So you know that the, that secure software supply chain notion. I, I think getting getting your arms wrapped around that uh, and and maybe doing some of the really simple stuff like I think yeah. you were suggesting this, Jeff, which was uh, it doesn't take much to do a tabletop exercise. You know, let, let's let's uh, make up a uh, an issue. Yeah. Um, let's see how quickly we could respond to pick you know pick a library that's uh, you know that's that's used regularly. Um, you know pick that and, and go through the exercise. How quickly can you respond to it? Um, and, and what would you do when, when it happens? If it's bad enough, maybe you pull the plug on everything that's running in production. You know, you cut the wire between you know, the outside world and, and your system because it's that bad. Yeah. Uh, or based on the risk, you know, you scoot things a little bit further downstream and take some precautionary, you know, uh, up, update your WAF, do, you know, block, block certain traffic, that, that kind of thing. But, but yeah. I think it's that, it's it's a it's a massive landscape uh, to to try to uh, try to get your arms around, and that's probably why comp organizations um, maybe leave way too much to chance, uh, and or haven't uh, dove into it as as far as they 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 probably should. Yeah, it's a it's a little bit of a black swan if you get a really bad breach, but like you know, every once in a while, there's. A really bad one, like an Equifax or uh, Solar Winds, or you know those those kinds of major attacks. But I will say, like uh, you know, if you look at the data, almost everybody is breached three or four times a year. When you ask CISOs, they get breached through their applications three or four times a year, and the average cost is like four million each time. So it's expensive. I really believe that number, honestly. It's more money. When you think yeah, about Kronos, absolutely. it talked probably $10 million for that. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm encouraged by some of the things in the executive order. I think it's driving towards more visibility and I think like making it visible here is kind of the key, whether you do it internally or publicly. Uh, I think you're going to be forced to do it publicly over the course of the next, you know, five years probably. Uh, government's going to demand more visibility into what's in your software and what you did to secure it. There's as part of the executive order. There's even a, a provision about security labeling of software, which uh, I think will go a long way towards sort of changing the market and. Labels have changed lots of markets, right? Food labels, uh, SBOM is a little bit like a food label, but take it a little further, there's things like, uh, you know, Energy Star and MPA ratings on uh, your, your music and movie ratings and car window labels and all sorts of things. Labels work, labels change markets. And uh, right now the software market's kind of broken because you can't tell whether what you're buying is secure or not. So you have really no incentive to like buy the secure thing. You just, you know, buy it for other reasons. Wouldn't it be cool to choose your bank based on which one had the best, uh, the most secure website? As opposed to like, which one gives you a better toaster? Where's the grade? I want to find it. <laughs> hey, look, Wait. you don't have to uh, like, you can start preparing for this stuff right now. It's not hard to gather information from your applications, build a database of what open source libraries you're using, and really start to get your head around you know, where you are. Uh, it, 
this is not a super complicated engineering challenge. Uh, it's way easier than, for instance, making sure all your code doesn't have vulnerabilities in it. This is really about just, are you using libraries with known vulnerabilities? Which would be like saying, I don't want to use, I don't want to drive a car that has an, a, a component that is likely to explode at some point. Where can I find my recall from my open source right now? Yeah. There is no infrastructure for issuing a recall. Lots of other industries have recalls. If you put out food that's contaminated or drugs or cars, there's recalls. You'll be notified if you own that thing that's uh, subject to that. But for software, nothing, not even close. We've got, like I said, we've got a, a handful of volunteer researchers out there doing that testing. And when they find something, they often just like post a blog about it or put it on Twitter. It's not like an organized effort to get control of this situation. <laughs> Commercial software has 70 to 80% of open source inside of it. Think about it. Almost also uh, commercial software uses open source. That's true. The, the statistics, like you'll read this stat a lot and it's misleading. The statistic says that 80% of most software is open source and it's misleading. If you're only looking at like the total volume of code, like the megabytes of code, that's sort of true. But most of that code never runs. Most dependencies, the majority of dependencies never get invoked or loaded. So when you actually look at, the, if you just looked at the code that runs, two thirds of it is your custom code and one third is library code. And we measure this you know, across tens of thousands of applications. We actually measure how libraries are used. So these are like really well understood metrics. Uh, we pu published a report about open source last year that talks about a lot of that if you're interested. So I mean, does that imply your... that common libraries have like grown out of control and, and there's, you know, a better way to do libraries going forward or? No, it doesn't really matter. Like having unused libraries in your binary doesn't really matter. It's just like having junk in the trunk that you never use. Like it doesn't really, it doesn't affect whether the car is going to blow up. But uh, you know, so sometimes people say, well, we got to get rid of all that unused code. And I'm like, man, don't worry about that. You got bigger fish to fry. Like get rid of the stuff that you're actually using that has known vulnerabilities in it. That's where you should be spending your time. It's like the third seat of your SUV. Who uses it? If you don't have a large family and there's only two of you, it's wasted space. It's the same thing about using software. Minimize it. Minimize it to a two-seater. Quarkus. Is totally disagree. I mean, I, I, that's, that's just wasted effort. You could spend the time to rip out the third seat, but why not just fold it down and, and put your dogs back there or something? Who cares? Like, focus on your engine. That's where you got to spend your security time. Right. Yeah. You want to find the things that are like the, the fires that you need to actually put out. And then once the fires are out, you can, you can focus on the, on the back seat of the SUV. <laughs> So Phil asked a great question. Is there a way to mark the packages listed in the SBOM as to whether they're used at runtime or only build time? Seems like a big pain point. Uh, and so some SBOMs do that. The SBOM standard, there's, I, I think Cyclone DX and uh, SPDX are the two leading ones. SPDX supports that kind of annotation. And it's, uh, I think there's, there's another level. There's build time which uh, you, know, you probably don't care about. There's all the libraries that are present at runtime. And then there's the libraries that are used at runtime. And my suggestion is you focus on the libraries that are used at runtime. That's the ones that matter. Everything else is just you know, stuff in the trunk. You have to so be able to exercise uh, it. You have to be able to exercise the code though, to find all the edges. Yeah. So just measure, like let, let people use your application for a while and then all the code will be loaded. It actually doesn't take long for uh, you to, to achieve maximum code loading in an application. Like it happens within you know, a pretty short amount of time 
uh, most libraries get loaded right away. Like right when the application starts up, if they're gonna get loaded, they get loaded right away. They'll get loaded, but they may not be exercised. They'll be in the class path. I agree that they'll be in the class path. No, but they no, that's may not what never be exercised. In order for them to be loaded, a call has to be made to at least one class in that library. So it is invoked if it gets loaded. Java, like Java and other languages don't load code that they don't need to load because it just waste is waste of memory. Well, I might disagree with that a little bit. That's a fact. I've been working on Java since Java 1.0. I'm, <laughs> I'm really familiar with how that process works. So anyway, hey, thank you, everybody. Um, I, I'll stop here because we're uh, right at the top of the hour, but uh, really appreciate the time. If you have any other questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me on LinkedIn. Uh, you know, kind of anything related to AppSec, if I can help, I'll try and help. And, uh, you know, if you want to talk about contrast and what we can do to help you, please reach out to John. He's uh, looking forward to talking with you as well. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Really appreciate you coming to talk. And, you know, this is a huge help for the community. So we really appreciate being here. Right, and thank uh, you. Really yeah, appreciate all the dialogue. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, if there's any, if uh, I will get with Drew and let him know uh, how awesome it was. And I'll go ahead and stop the recording too. There we go.